had enough in reserves where I think I could have withstood the storm that was to come. But, you know, maybe I didn't need to quit my job at that time because it, it all works out in the end. Everything comes out in the wash, so to speak. But maybe not quit it right away, but at least quit it sooner than I did. And that's more so for me, not for anybody else who is straddling the fence between being an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur within your job. But it does lend itself to taking some self-inventory and go, all right, what what is it that I really want? And, and how can I position myself to fully realize that? And, and at that time, that the job was just in the way. What's up, Unfound Nation? Dan Kihanya here. Thanks so much for checking out another episode of Founders Unfound. That was Rod Johnson, co-founder of the preeminent Black-owned coffee company in America, Black & Bold, which was founded with the desire to unite coffee and tea lovers worldwide through a common interest of investing in community. I can't tell you, Unfound Nation, how excited I am to have Rod on the podcast. I've been a consumer and a fan of Black and Bold for quite some time. Rod grew up in the working class city of Gary, Indiana, and eventually went on to Indiana University and a career in development and giving. But he soon had a restlessness that only business ownership could fix. Along with his lifelong friend, Purnell, Rod set out to find their entrepreneurial calling, one that could match purpose with profit. And so, Black & Bold was born in 2018. Since then, Rod and Purnell have grown Black & Bold into a national brand carried by the likes of Target and Whole Foods. They have a rare licensing deal with the NBA and have been celebrated by Dwayne Wade on The Ellen Show. All this completely bootstrapped from their headquarters in Des Moines, Iowa. Rod has a great story. You will want to listen in. Our episode is sponsored by Afroblox, the global pan-African freelance marketplace and collaboration platform. A great resource for devs, designers, and virtual assistants. Check out the link in the show notes. And please make sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. We are available anywhere you get your podcasts, even YouTube. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn at Founders Unfound. And if you like what you hear, drop us a five-star review on Apple or at podchaser.com. Finally, make sure to tell your friends about us. We appreciate every new listener. Now, on with the episode. Stay safe and hope you enjoy. Hello, and welcome to Founders Unfound, spotlighting the best startups you don't know yet. We bring you stories of exceptional founders from underrepresented and underestimated backgrounds. This is the latest episode in our continuing series on founders of African descent. I'm your host, Dan Kihanya. Let's get on it. Today, we have Rod Johnson, co-founder of Black & Bold, a company formed from lifelong friendship and shared values with the desire to unite coffee and tea lovers worldwide through a common interest in investing in community, specifically for the youth. Welcome to the show, Rod. We're super excited to have you on. Thanks for making the time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Terrific. As I was mentioning before we recorded, I'm so excited to have you on the show. I'm personally a big fan, especially for the last couple of years. But for the few who might not be familiar with Black and Bold, tell us, what is the company about? Yeah, no, I, I think you you summed it up perfectly in, in the onset. But, you know, we are a four-year-old coffee company that started in my friend's garage with this intent to bridge the gap between community impact and the beverages that those communities consume on a daily basis. So ultimately, we are a coffee roastery that gives a portion of our proceeds back to organizations that support youth in need. So this this brainchild that has blossomed into a business ultimately is a pathway for people to reciprocate the love back to the communities of our consumers. I love that. And I think one of the things I talk about is that a lot of the modern brands today are brands as movements, really. The products and services are sort of a byproduct of that context. So we're going to dig more into Black and Bold for sure. But before we get there, would love to hear a little bit about your story. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Yeah, well, born and raised in Gary, Indiana. Uh, it's about 30 minutes outside of Chicago. Very interesting community, has a lot of historical relevance, if you will, in the sense that it was the epicenter for the steel industry and infamous for a few other reasons as well, like being the birthplace of Michael Jackson and the Jackson family. And it was featured in the Music Man musical. And, and again, a lot of different nuggets, if you will, that, that tie back to Gary. And that's a, a huge part of my story and just my overall POV because it shaped who I am today. You know, I am 
also a father. I am a sibling. I'm a son, proud graduate of Indiana University and and a lover of, of all things coffee and tea. You know, and that's just kind of the 30,000 foot view of who I am. And, you know, just a, a guy who, who likes to have a have a good time over some great beverages. I love it. So tell me, as a child growing up, was your family connected to the industrial side of Gary? Did you have a sense of this is what people in my community do? Was entrepreneurship anywhere in there? Yeah, I was surrounded by entrepreneurship, but not any direct connections. My pops worked in the sanitary industry, and my mom was an administrative assistant for a a local community college. So no direct connectivity to the industrial side of things, at least not early on. In fact, my direct connection to the industrial industry that is prevalent in Gary came after my freshman year in college. So I went back home after freshman year and needed a summer job because I was too young for an internship. And I had an uncle who worked in the steel mill. And he's like, come, you know, get your hands dirty and see what the real world is like. You know how uncles are. And I worked the graveyard shift for the full summer after my my freshman year, working from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. in a steel mill. Wow. And that was absolutely a learning experience. What my biggest takeaway was is that I am better used, <laughs> not necessarily using my hands. I, I'm, I'm more of a behind the scenes, a strategist. I found that out very quickly that summer. I'll bet. I can remember I did the same thing my, after my freshman year, and I remember finishing that summer experience saying, yeah, I'm going to stay in college, I think, and see if I have other opportunities. <laughs> Absolutely. And listen, I, I got a big respect for people who, who do that because that's hard work, right? They are earning that living. And yeah, you know, everyone has, has a role, if you, uh, so to speak. And, uh, and I found out very quickly that that wasn't the role for me. I was more of a distraction than I was an asset. So when you're growing up in high school, would you characterize yourself as creative, athletic, analytical? Did you have any sense of those attributes, traits, passions? Yeah, definitely analytical. Certainly focused a lot of my time, effort, and energy on athletics. I was a three-sport athlete. I was a participant in a lot of different school clubs, whether it been the business club or student council and things of that nature. So my goal was to stay as active as possible and took a buffet approach to figure out what it was that I liked and what I was interested in. What resonated with me most was I really like the study of people. I like watching human behavior. In fact, my I, I end up majoring in criminal justice and getting a minor in sociology. So I kind of pursued that in some degree, and I attribute my curiosity very early on in landing on that being my discipline. Fascinating. Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of gravitational pull to this idea that we wanna we wanna try to observe, understand sometimes analyze how people around us interact. When you were thinking about college, did you have a sense of that particular major or or those themes? And did your family come from going to college? Was it encouraged? Was it something new for your journey? That was the only option, right? It was like, hey, Rod, you're going to do this. (laughs) And and there's no ifs, ands, buts about it. It's just a matter of where. Uh, and I was a pretty smart kid too. So I I was geared, you know, just naturally wired towards pursuing post-secondary education anyway. My mom is also a college graduate. She graduated from Indiana State and got a degree in accounting. So that was all always, again, that was the baseline, if you will, as to what, what was next. What I would pursue, I figured that out when I got to college. I had an affinity for law and understanding like why people committed crimes. Again, going back to just being very observant. Growing up in Gary kind of lends itself to that because one thing that I didn't mention that Gary was and is infamous for is the crime rate. Unfortunately, back in the 90s, in fact, it was considered the murder capital of America and still to this day boasts some pretty staggering crime rates. And being surrounded by that and fortunate enough to overcome it, I wanted to understand why people did it. So essentially, that is why I decided on those disciplines. Makes a lot of sense for sure. And I think a lot of times we come out of certain environments and we either want to double down on those environments or figure out why they were like that. I'm curious about going to University of Indiana. I've been there a couple of times, amazingly beautiful, large campus. 
was there a cultural adjustment that you had coming from growing up in Gary to the university setting? And sort of like, how was that transition like? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I mean, definitely a culture shock, right? Not that I was coddled at home, but there definitely isn't coddling at a Big Ten university, right? Like you are one of 40,000 people on a campus and you ultimately have to figure it out, right? There are, def- there are resources available for you to to take advantage of, but you got to have the insight to know what those resources are for you to actually leverage them to, to your advantage. So it did take a little bit of getting used to and trying to figure out what my niche was and, and how would I be comfortable in that new environment. Ultimately, I think I figured it out. And I'm grateful that I took that path because it, it gives me a, a greater appreciation for that journey and pursuing that collegiate degree. And I imagine, I mean, I think for a lot of folks who go to big universities like that, there's a new diversity. I mean, not just sort of cultural or racial ethnic. I mean, there's social economic and people who come from big cities and rural areas. And so there's this crossroads sometimes when you get there, like, do I embrace that and try to figure out how to understand other people? Or do I sort of like find my own group and just sort of hunker down with them? And so it's, it's a really interesting journey for a lot of folks. Yeah, I think I did a little bit of both. I certainly found my tribe and found my support system, those that we were like-minded, had similar backgrounds, similar interests, similar aspirations, and that's where I spent the majority of my time. But I didn't let that impact my curiosity and learning and building new relationships. In fact, I pursued jobs on campus that gave me access to different cultures, different personalities. In fact, well, my first job on campus, or rather my second job on campus, was working for the Indiana University Telefund. So essentially, we were the people that were responsible for interrupting your dinners and asking for 20 bucks. Right? Like, hey, do you want to give back to your alma mater? And that one introduced me to the depth and the diversity of our alumni of all of our alumni, as well as those that were actually on on campus as well. So I'm very grateful that I embarked on those because that's what the real world is like. It's not monolithic and you're going to have to encounter and deal with people from all walks of life. So I took full advantage of getting a head start on that during my undergrad years. Very smart. Very smart indeed. So let's talk about that. So you you came out of school and did you have a sense of where you were going to go, what you were going to do, what your career in front of you was going to be? No, absolutely not. All right. So (laughs) I remember January of my graduate, my my senior year thinking, what am I going to do? Because I'm going to graduate here in the spring and I don't have any job offers lined up, nor do I know what I really want to do. But what I had been doing up until that point was building a resume and a resume of some real tangible results that, that I could ultimately leverage. So by working at the telefund, I was able to just get some real world experience that I ultimately parlayed into a career. So upon graduation, I continued down the fundraising journey and ultimately was responsible for managing annual fund centers for different colleges, universities, and healthcare centers across America. So I did that for about four years or so, four or five years and continue to ascend up those ranks, whereas it took me from behind the scenes as a fundraising strategist to more on the front lines and being a development officer and someone to actually curate the relationship between benefactors and the beneficiaries. So did that for, you know, 10 plus years after college, but it all does date back to that summer job that I picked up because I didn't want to go back to Gary and work in a steel mill for another summer. There you go. That's fascinating. And it's really interesting that you got a chance to sort of be exposed to that world in a way that was like, hey, this is a job. Seems like a cool job. I get paid. But then you got to see sort of the many pieces of it. And we've had other folks on our show who are entrepreneurs who came from similar backgrounds in terms of either nonprofits or fundraising. And there tends to be, I think, a lot of connections because fundraising is, you know, there's a sales element to it. There's a strategy element, certainly communication, messaging, even from a marketing perspective, like with channels and, and that kind of stuff. So 
you're hitting the nail on the head. My business partner, so I, I didn't start this business by myself. My, my friend and I are doing this in tandem and I joke with him all the time because we have complementary backgrounds. So he actually worked in sales to some degree while I was on the nonprofit side of things. And, and I, I tease him and say that I'm a, a better salesperson considering that I had to sell feelings. I had to sell sentiments and nostalgia. It's much easier to sell a widget, right? I, hey, if you buy this thing, then you get the value of it. But to sell someone an idea and convey it as though it's an investment, it does require a certain skill set. And also embedded in that career is this idea of persistence and resiliency, because not everyone is looking to be separated from their money, right? Especially when they don't get a widget in return. And that not everyone understands the idea of investing in higher education or healthcare. So you get told no a lot. And that is 1000% synonymous with an entrepreneurial journey. We've had a lot of doors close in our face over these past four years, despite the success that we have been able to amass. And I attribute being able to overcome those objections to cutting our teeth very early on in our respective careers. I love that. And that's such a great insight, like this idea of selling ideas, selling nostalgia. I often tell my kids, you know, when they were growing up and doing extracurricular stuff, I said, one of the hardest things to do is to try and get a volunteer to do something because they don't have to. <laughs> and it's the same thing when you're asking for donations or contributions. It's like, that is a skill that is preeminent because like you said, they don't have a widget to take home and say, I got this widget. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I encourage people to, there's a couple of careers that people should pursue early on, right? The working in retail, working in the restaurant industry, or working in some type of telecommunication. The skills that you acquire on those respective paths, they can serve you tremendous benefit as you continue to grow and do other things. Yeah, that's so true. So true. So take me into the transition into being an entrepreneur. Were you at a point in your career where you were looking for something different or did this just this opportunity just present itself and you, you and Pradell had to say, let's go do it? How did that sort of evolve? Yeah. So I, I can speak from my, what got me to the point, the breaking point, if you will. And it was feeling unfulfilled. You know, I had continued to ascend up the ranks in corporate America or in the nonprofit space and pretty much running my, my own shop, if you will. And while I appreciated that autonomy, I appreciated being able to run through the finish line and everything that came along with the role that, that I last was in, it just didn't resonate with me. I, I would go home feeling like, there is a void. There was something missing. And I was longing for that. So simultaneously, my business partner was having similar thoughts, right? So as, as he's ascending up the ranks as a salesperson and, and building small businesses and taking them to retail and scaling them to eight, nine figures of revenue a year, he's like, well, all right, I've done that. What, what else is out there? And can I use these skills in a way that benefits things that I, I care about a little bit more. So it was just having those conversations, having that dialogue and taking self-inventory as we were entering our 30s, right? And just like, okay, where the 20s were for fun, 20s were for us, but okay, now how how can we be more of an asset to to our communities? And so ultimately it was us feeling unfulfilled and wanting to take control of our respective futures as opposed to running the rat race. I love that. And we're going to hear a little bit about how that transitioned into what became Black and Bold. But right now, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Rod Johnson from Black and Bold. You're a visionary founder building the next big thing, but your ever-growing to-do list is slowing you down. Well, lucky for you, getting things done just got easier. Introducing AfriBlocks. AfriBlocks can connect you with the top freelance talent in all of Africa, and they will manage the project for you. We have vetted thousands of software developers, graphic designers, social media managers, and virtual assistants who can help you save time, save money, and build better. Get it done right the first time. Visit afriblocks.com and tell us Dan sent you to get 10% off your first job. So we're back with Rod from Black and Bold. Rod, before the break, we were talking about sort of that season for you and Pranell about wanting to find something else. Tell us a little bit about how you came together. But before we actually dive into that, why don't we talk about the fact that you have a relationship that predates Black and Bold, the two of you? 
Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've been friends since we were like 13 or 14 years old. I moved to Purnell's side of town after my freshman year in high school and met him as he was like bouncing a basketball in his front yard. There weren't a lot of kids on the block anyway, so he stood out and he also had a basketball court in his backyard. So I was like, oh, this dude has to be my friend. And we have have been hanging out and, and rocking with each other ever since. And it is that foundation that we use to build our business. So, you know, a lot of uncomfortable conversations that come along when you have a business partner or co-founder, it's easier for us to navigate that because we have that background, we have that history, and therefore it gives us the understanding of knowing this comes from a good place. There's no malicious intent behind this disagreement or this recommendation. Or, or anything along those lines. And I'm very grateful because it allows us to focus on the needs of the business as opposed to the dynamics between he and I. That's so powerful. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of folks maybe sometimes miss estimate just how much of a connection and you know sometimes people talk about you're married to your co-founder because it's a long journey. You spend a lot of time together. The fact that you have this relationship, you have that dynamic and that you can amplify that through the business, like you said, and say a one plus one equals five. You know, that is very true. We, we jokingly say that we are married to each other because we spend more time with each other than we do with our respective families now. And even more so when we were first starting the business. At the time, I lived in California while Pernell was here in Des Moines where the business is, is headquartered at. I mean, we would be on the phone just throwing ideas back and forth hours at a time, like four or five hours from 8 p.m. to midnight, right? We, we were embodying the idea of a five to nine, and that hasn't dissipated since. We still spend the same amount of time with each other. And if you're going to do that, you might as well like the person. So I'm very grateful that, that we have that relationship. That's awesome. So I would love to just hear, obviously, you landed on coffee and Neither one of you have like a tremendously deep background in coffee. What was second choice or what was something that made it to the final selection that ultimately you didn't do? I'd love to hear that story as well. Yeah, yeah. So you're absolutely right. We don't have any formal connectivity to the coffee industry or didn't have any formal connectivity to the coffee industry prior to starting a business. We just enjoyed the product. But what was in the final running? We knew that we didn't want to have any services, so everything was going to be a good, it was going to be a widget of some kind. Some ideas that we threw against the wall, one was like bed linens. I think that was one of them. We had also talked about, I think it was another type of apparel. Whatever was on that list, it was going to have to be easy for us to connect it to this idea of community impact. And it's the more tangible the product, the easier it is for people to wrap their minds around that this thing, you buy this thing, then it's doing this good in the community. So those are a couple of things that we threw against the wall, but it didn't stick. You know, we just looked at our own habits, looked at our own purchases recently and figured, all right, are we passionate about these things? And that's what propelled coffee and tea above the rest because those beverages showed up in our lives in so many different, so many different moments, both good and bad. And we figured that let's build around this community that we know exists in relation to both coffee and tea. I love that. And I love the fact that you explored, right, and had this missional aspect as sort of the filter, right? It's like, yeah, if we do this, can we connect it to this idea of community and giving back? So my own story is I drank coffee in college and a little bit as a young adult, and then I stopped for 20 years. And I came back a few years ago, and I'm a coffee drinker now. And so I kind of dove into it, and I, I do pour over and, you know, but the thought of me trying to roast my own coffee <laughs> is tremendously frightening to me. <laughs> I would love to hear as somebody who was at some point a novice with that. How did you all figure out how to do that? Yeah. I mean, how, how does anyone figure out how to do things nowadays? YouTube. <laughs> That's it. You go to YouTube. 
that's our North Star, it's our Bible, it's it's what governs us essentially. I mean, from learning how to tie a tie to cutting your own hair to learning how to roast coffee, the content is out there, and that's essentially how we learn. We watch a lot of YouTube videos and coupled that with trial and error, we ultimately landed on coffee that was consumable. Trust me, very early on, those beans were as black as tar. Like we didn't we didn't know what we were doing what whatsoever. I've told this story before, but, you know, in the fire department, PJ had the, the fire department called on him because of how much smoke was emitting from his garage. We retrofitted his garage to be a makeshift roastery and the smoke has to go somewhere. Imagine how much smoke comes when you're burning a pound of coffee beans. So, you know, people are calling like, hey, man, what's going on with your house? So we see all the smoke <laughs> coming. He's like, no, I'm experimenting right now. I'm, I'm trying to learn how to roast coffee. So those were some dark times, no pun intended, <laughs> very, very early on. But we figured it out. Naturally curious and and wanting to figure it out, I think, is why we were able to. I think you're, you're so right. The information is out there and, and you can get to a point where you can feel competent, if not work towards mastery. So you figure it out. You know, I love the name and that the fact that you were able to have that name is awesome. You know, funny thing about that is... I wasn't necessarily against the name, but I wasn't a huge advocate for it. For what the name represents, it checks off all the boxes for me, but I didn't know how well it would be received. That was something that we had a lot of dialogue about. We were like, is it too overt? Is that going to turn people off? It's a double entendre because it represents the products inside the bag, but then also represents us as people and how we show up in whatever spaces that we're in. I was hesitant in naming the company that, but I remember Pete telling me or giving me this charge and saying, hey, man, if we're going to do this. We're going to have to do it differently, right? Like we, we can't play it safe. We got to take some risks. We had the safety net of corporate America, right? Our, our careers were ascending on their respective paths. And it was pretty much set in stone where they were going to end up. And that obviously wasn't a path that we wanted to continue on. So we were like, let's go take a leap of faith. And if we're going to take a leap of faith, it needs to be represented in every aspect of our business, including and especially the name. So I'm glad that he talked me off the ledge because most people like what we represent as represented by our name. That's a great story. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, there's a certain irony there, right? Like this name, you had to live into the name and uh, we have to be bold if we're going to be black and bold. Absolutely. It's an interesting story too, in the context of, you know, when I talk to black founders, if their product has that context, right, either they're trying to serve their community or there's either a representation or a brand culture element to it, there is that tension around is that something that we want to celebrate? Is that something that we, as a part of it, is it more about the product and the innovation? And I think a lot of founders who don't have that, that aspect don't understand that challenge and how difficult that is. It's not, it's not a trivial decision. Couldn't agree more. And, you know, when we, we were having those conversations back and forth, we were like, if it does turn people off, then those are not the people we need to be talking to anyway. Those are not our customers. And a very early on, we, we, we set out as to who we wanted to serve. And we, we knew that we, we can't be everything for everyone. So let's make sure that we show up for the people who are actually those that need to be in our ecosystem. I love that. And I, especially with a category like coffee, which is a, both a commodity and like a gazillion choices, you almost have to have a pretty divergent perspective and market position. So you figured out a roast coffee, you start selling, I imagine you start selling online or directly. How did you make that leap into distribution and folks like Whole Foods and Target and Hy-Vee? And how did you make that leap? And what was that like in terms of like, oh my gosh, it's not just like somebody puts in an order online and we fulfill it. It's like minimum orders and supply chain. And how, how did you make that leap as a company? Oh, man, we did it afraid, right? I mean, you know, we, we, we are the definition of building the plane while we fly it. So when we launched the business, you're right, we did launch online only. We are a digitally native brand. So we figured out Shopify and got everything up and running. And it wasn't until a year and a half later that we actually got significant retail distribution. There were a few local grocery stores here in the Des Moines area that carried our products. And 
that gave us a little bit of a taste test as to what it would be like to work with a retailer in that regard. But working with Target, which was our first national account, night and day, right? It was just totally different. And it required us to grow up as a business very, very quickly because to your point, those MOQs, they don't care that <laughs> that, that you're a small business. It's if you want your product on, these show, on the shelves, then you, you, you have to meet our requirements. You have to meet our minimums. And fortunate for us, though, we had a little bit insider trading knowledge, so to speak, because Pernell's first job out of college was working for Target Corporation in Minneapolis. And so understanding those dynamics and how that ecosystem works gave us a a leg up in the game so that we could build our business for that moment. We knew that retail was going to be a part of our go-to-market strategy. In fact, it's our primary go-to-market strategy right now, and, and that's rooted in making our products and therefore our social impact model accessible. So we built the business with the end goal in mind, and that was competing at shelf with other household brands. And when we finally got that award, it was all systems go. It was now we need to adopt and we need to adapt very quickly because now we're in the big leagues, right? It's, it's no longer playing in the minors. You know, those pitches are coming at you 90 miles per hour every <laughs> single time. Uh, so unless you're trying to get struck out, you're going to have to really stand your ground. And that was a learning experience for us. And, and it continues to evolve with new retailers. But we got a good foundation and we, we built upon that. Was there ever a challenge or a, or a friction point where you said to yourselves, can we pull this off? Absolutely. So we started in P's Garage. And from there, we outgrew it and were fortunate to land in the back of a brewery. So there's a local brewery here that allowed us to lease about, I don't know, a thousand square feet of their production space. And that's where we fulfilled our first target order. Again, at the time, I, I still lived in California and it was Pernell and I for all intents and purposes. <laughs> so I would travel back and forth. I stayed out here for about a week or so to get that target order out the door. And at that time is when we brought on our first employee um, because we're like, there's absolutely no way that we're going to be able to prepare for this national launch. We had to get product in, I think it was about 360 stores at that time. And while that may not seem like a lot in the grand scheme of things, when it's two people packaging coffee from sunup to sundown, it is extremely exhausting. But we made it work and uh, knew immediately thereafter that we had to make the investments in our personnel so that we're not in that position again. Yeah, there you go. I think entrepreneurs reach a point where it's like, we're not scalable. <laughs> we, As human beings, we have a finite capacity. So again, we, we started the conversation earlier about how this a foundation of community and giving back. I have two questions on that. One is, how did you determine where you were going to aim that aspect of your business in terms of what groups you wanted to work with, what groups you wanted to support and make an impact with? And then my second question is, is even though you're still early as a company, has there been tension that you've had to address across like, hey, this is a commercial side of our business, but there's also this impact side of our business. Have they ever been in conflict? I can answer the latter question first. The answer is no. And that's because that's been a part of who we are since the inception of our business, since it was an idea. We knew that we wanted to have some type of community element woven into everything that we did. So to that point, it's never been a point of contention between the the social impact and the, the commercialization of our business. Where there was some dialogue, some disagreement was how do we bring the idea of social impact to life? And it was all healthy fun dialogue. Do we do a one for one like Tom's, for example, you buy a pair of shoes, they give a pair of shoes. Do we give book bags to kids? Do we want to support a certain city? Is there a particular initiative like financial literacy? So we just had a lot of good, healthy conversation. But what we ultimately landed on was, A, we knew we wanted to help kids because we wanted to impact our community as early as we possibly could. Two, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to have ownership of the curriculum or the experience per se we want to be a vehicle of and then three how can our impact grow as we grow as a company and so how that ultimately has been manifested is that we get five percent of our proceeds to 15 nonprofit organizations across america 
these organizations are keenly focused on helping youth in need. And they are in locations or in markets where we have a retail distribution. So it helps close the loop for consumers. They go to their local Target store and they say, hey, I know that by buying this coffee is going to help this nonprofit organization that's on Third Street or whatever the case may be. It makes it much more tangible and therefore digestible. For people and the 15 organizations, they are doing some amazing work for kids, whether it be providing them with access to information. We talked about how important that is. I joke with my friends all the time. I say, hey, man, your iPhone is for much more than just taking cool photos for Instagram. Like you can do a lot with that. You have the world's most powerful tool in your pocket, and that's the internet. You have access to information. But imagine if you don't have that access, it's extremely limiting and you're starting at a deficit. So, you know, we we partner with CompuDopt down in Houston, Texas, that provides refurbished laptops for kids to pursue their dreams. We also partner with organizations that promote the idea of a healthy lifestyle through urban farming. So I think about like city growers in New York or Greening Youth Foundation in Atlanta, Again, the idea was to pour into that demographic that are the demographic of kids in urban areas and do it in a comprehensive way, taking into consideration Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We we start at the bottom of the pyramid, making sure people have their basic needs, right? Like shelter, food, things of that nature, and and ultimately try to ascend to the top of that pyramid, which is self-actualization, which is what it means to to be your full self and be confident in that. So that was the, the theory in building out our social impact model. I love that. I really appreciate the fact that, you know, you said that there hasn't been a contention because by definition, you said we're not going to have one. This is this is aligned. And I, I think that is so powerful when you're starting as a native brand to have that clear value in mind of how you want to show up in the world as a business. Yeah, there, there's so many other businesses that let's take 2020, for example. We saw a lot of people pivot. Well, you saw a lot of businesses now start to raise their pom poms and really cheer that we we support DEI initiatives and we are all for communities that have been over criminalized by the police, et cetera, et cetera. But now, two years later, they don't hear the same noise, right? Like it was performative, in my opinion. People were just doing it because they felt societal pressure. They felt that it was trendy. It was something to do for the moment. And it, it wasn't genuine. It's not authentic. And people realize that. Consumers are much more savvy. We got access to information and they make those decisions. They vote every day with their dollars. And so we knew that with the rise of conscious consumerism, based on our own experience, you know, our own shopping habits, we, we go by with companies that we, we resonate more with. We were like, we need to build our business for that person, that person that cares more than about coffee. It's thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of coffee companies. All right, what's going to make y'all different? What's going to make us different is that we're going to be non-pretentious. We're going to be welcoming. And we're going to take something that you do every day and connect it to something that we know you really care about. Build with values for those who shop with values. I love it. Well, we're going to take another short break and we'll be right back with Rod Johnson from Black and Bold. You're a visionary founder building the next big thing, but your ever-growing to-do list is slowing you down. Well, lucky for you, getting things done just got easier. Introducing AfriBlocks. AfriBlocks can connect you with the top freelance talent in all of Africa, and they will manage the project for you. We have vetted thousands of software developers, graphic designers, social media managers, and virtual assistants who can help you save time, save money, and build better. Get it done right the first time. Visit AfriBlocks.com and tell us Dan sent you to get 10% off your first job. So we're back with Rod Johnson from Black and Bold. So, Rod, fast forward a little bit. We were just talking about the journey of the company and the impact aspects, which are foundational. So recent news and recent notoriety and awareness you've had with uh, the Ellen DeGeneres show and hanging with D. Wade, and you've got this licensing arrangement with the NBA. Just amazing, amazing journey so far. But what I'd like to hear from you is, let's just say, pick a time in the future, three years, five years, 10 years, and... Black and Bold is a success. Not that it isn't a success now, but the the ultimate pinnacle of what you want it to be. And Dan comes along and says, hey, Rod, do you think it was a success? You say yes. Why are you going to say it's a success? What is going to be your measure of success for Black and Bold? What success looks like 
to me now, three years, five years in perpetuity is very simple. That people mention our company when we talk about businesses that walk it like they talk it, that show up for their communities, that stand for much more than their own profits, that that we ultimately prioritize stakeholders as well as shareholders. I want us to be the premier example of that. That is what success looks like to me. If that happens, that means that we are living up to the pledge that we've made to the Before Our Youth initiative, that we are continuously providing luxury products for our community. And you know, lastly, it's an ex- experience that isn't limited to people regardless of where they are on their coffee journey, so to speak. So that's really what success looks like to me is that we embody the idea of, of conscious consumerism and we continue to be an example that you don't have to put one over the other, that that purpose and profit can coexist as harmoniously as you want them to be. Great, powerful vision. I'm on board for sure. So let's switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about kind of fundraising and capital and how have you thought about that aspect of this business and have you self-funded it? Have you thought about getting funding from outside? Have you gone that route? Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, well, we're completely bootstrapped. Parnell and I took some savings and some bonus checks uh, and, you know, just found some some change <laughs> in the cup holder <laughs> and put it towards the business. And that's all who sits at, at our cap table is just Parnell and I. And we retain 100% ownership of our company. And that is the plan, at least for right now and for the foreseeable. But with that, you know, it's pros and cons. It, it just compels us to be deliberate about how we grow, right? We, we certainly don't want to run into a situation where our eyes are bigger than our stomach or slash our wallets. And whatever investments that we do make, it is going to have a very clear ROI. That's bold well for us to this point. We've been able to, like I said, retain 100% ownership, and and that has manifested itself into being able to donate back to those organizations over $100,000 over these past four years. And while that is a foundation that we want to continue to build upon, we're, we're really grateful and satisfied that we've been able to do that to this point. That's great. And there's a lot to be said for self determination and growing at a could clip, but not unreasonable or artificially accelerated and, and it's sort of intentional, right? And like you said, the ability to give uh, over $100,000 is awesome. I mean, it's so powerful. Thank you. So yeah, that's incredible. Tell me a little bit about being in Iowa. Is the Midwest, I'm sure there's advantages and disadvantages to having a business that's based in Des Moines, Iowa. For sure. I recently relocated to Iowa, as I mentioned, from Sacramento. And while I grew up in the Midwest, Iowa is a little bit different. And not in a good or bad way, it's just different. I I will say there is a, a true lack of diversity here through an ethnic lens, but that has worked to our advantage because being a successful black owned business in a community that that wants to support small businesses uh, we've been the beneficiaries of a, a lot of uplifting moments in addition to that having a coffee business in Iowa and not in places like San Francisco or Seattle or New York gives us a competitive advantage because we're not in a, a crowded space we're not diluted by the thousand other coffee shops that that are on the corner so to speak so we've just been uh, we've trained ourselves to to focus on the positives that exist within here being in Iowa. Logistically, it makes sense because Des Moines, Iowa is at the intersection of two major highways, interstate highways, I-80, which goes east and west. And then you have 35, which goes north and south, pretty much across the whole U.S. So there's a lot of advantages that come with being in Iowa and it's definitely a conversation starter if it's not anything else, right? When people go, Where's, where are you headquartered? I say Des Moines, Iowa. Their response immediately is, there are black people in Iowa? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> at, at least two of them. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are at least two of us here. It's been a good time. On Crunchbase, they have these lists, right? Like, you know, women founders in the Bay Area. You know, they have like uh, black founders in Des Moines. It'd be like you and Brunel. And- <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's for- it's going to be a short list, my friend. I guarantee you, you that. You'll be number one. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's great. So let's talk a little bit about sort of being a Black founder. You know, that's one of the things we tried to explore a little bit on the show is kind of what does that mean? Is it something that's relevant? Is it sometimes relevant, sometimes not? Is the world remind you of it when it isn't necessarily relevant? Is there positives? Is there additional challenges? How do you view yourself as a Black founder? Do you think about yourself that way often? No, I don't think of myself that way because I've been Black forever, right? Like this is not something that's new to me. I look at it as like, I just don't happen to be black. I mean, I don't run away from that. I fully embrace my blackness, but I don't lead with that. I don't want anybody to do anything for me because I'm black. I want you to do it for me because I have a viable business. I want you to do it for me because I can provide value. I don't want the sympathy or the, the charity card. And there have been instances where the world or potential partners have come across that they only want to do business with us because of those reasons. And if it doesn't feel authentic, that's not something that, that we embark upon. So while it is hugely relevant, I don't want that to be the only reason why people rock with us in any capacity. We started this because we saw a lack of representation in the coffee industry, whether it be owners of the the experience or even just baristas. And so we knew that by starting this company, it would be we would represent something that where there is a void. And it's a, a position that that we sit in with pride. We definitely want to be the examples of uh, of what it's like to work with a black owned business in this industry that doesn't have a, a ton of representation. So ultimately, it does come up in many different instances. I think it's great. You know, I recently read a book about the coffee industry called Uncommon Grounds and black folks have been involved with coffee. I mean, it was basically discovered, right? And Yeah, in Ethiopia. Right. And when you talk about things like where it's grown in that sort of banned around the equator, slavery. And and so we've been a part of the coffee journey, in the global coffee history for a long time. Absolutely. But not in the way that you're doing it, right? With ownership and determination and representation. I would say that does exist, but just not so on this part of the supply chain. When we think about the producers of the coffee, the, you know, the farmers, the growers, the cultivators, the importers, the exporters, uh, there's a lot of Black people that that make up that ecosystem, but but to your point, that hasn't necessarily translated to the end part. So we have, think about it from farm to cup. From farm, yeah, it definitely has a lot of representation, but not necessarily to cup, and and that's where we come in. We we want to make sure that we close the loop on the representation within that supply chain. Like I said, I've been a fan for for as soon as, soon as I find out about you all. You you mentioned a little bit about twenty twenty. So one of my last questions is just around, I mean, between the pandemic and George Floyd and just how the supply chain works, give us one example or one element of like how the journey for Black and Bold changed in 2020. I would say 2020 represents an accelerant, or we at least look at 2020 as an accelerant of our business. So as I referenced, we are a digitally native brand. We, we started fulfilling orders via our online store. And when the world shut down in March and people weren't going to their normal coffee shops because they're closed and retailers weren't stocking the shelves as quickly as they, they were at, at one point, people had to find alternative means to do the normal stuff that they were doing, including and especially drinking coffee. So while the pandemic has been a bad word for many businesses, and rightfully so, uh, and especially Black businesses, I read like a staggering stat that it was something to the tune of like almost half of small Black-owned businesses close their doors permanently over these last couple of years. And, and I'm very, very sensitive to that in, in discussing our ascension at that time. It's a, it's a weird dichotomy because I, I want to be empathetic to the hardships and the barriers that 2020 presented. But then I also want to celebrate how we were able to overcome those things, just given the shift of the world. So it was that change in consumer behavior that really introduced us to a larger national audience. We had that change in consumer behavior layer on the top, the fact that our products were also available at Target on a national level that just allowed people to adopt us and adopt us more, more quickly. It was kind of a binary, I think, for a lot of businesses, like either as a trend that emerged or a whether that was, you know, temporary because of the shutdown or or it became more permanent, or it was the way the world works that supported my business disappeared. So uh, we'd like to end with the quintessential 
retrospective. If you could go back in time and talk to maybe Rod and Purnell in 2018 with this version of the Rod, what advice would you give them? What would you tell them to look out for? What would you tell them to do or not do? The advice that I will give myself in 2018, I probably would have told myself to quit my job then. I think that it was while I needed to put food on the table and pay the bills and all that good stuff, it was more of a distraction. And it definitely got up to a point in time where I was collecting a check, if I'm being totally honest with you. I was not doing my day-to-day work. I was fully consumed with Black and Bold. And I often wonder, had I done that sooner, would we have been able to grow? What would have happened, right? It's always the, I, I wonder what if. And that's the advice I would have given myself. I had enough in reserves where I think I could have withstood the storm that was to come. But you know, maybe I didn't need to quit my job at that time because it, it all works out in the end. Everything comes out in the wash, so to speak. But maybe not quit it right away, but at least quit it sooner than I did. And that's more so for me, not for anybody else who is straddling the fence between being an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur within your job. But it does lend itself to taking some self-inventory and go, all right, what is it that I really want and how can I position myself to fully realize that? And and at that time, the, the job was just in the way. So I probably should have just cut ties and dive a thousand percent into Black and Bolt. It's kind of a theme that we have these pauses. We're built with flight or fight. And so we have this mechanism of like, is it going to be safe? Am I going to be okay? And usually for entrepreneurs, it gets to that point where the dam just overspills and it's like, I cannot not do this. That was exactly it. It was, it got to that point where it's like, there's no way I'm not getting a lot of, I wasn't getting a lot of sleep anyway, but it's like, I'm going to get fired. So I might as well just quit. <laughs> it's like my, my performance is terrible and they know it. The good thing about that, though, is I was very upfront with my employer at the time that I did have this going on. Like, hey, I got this side hustle. I'm starting this thing out with my friends. So it made it easier to cut ties. The the writing was on the wall. Everyone knew it. It was just a matter of time. I should have just saved everybody some misery and done it sooner. I love that. I think some people are going to take that to heart, too, which is great. So we always like to end with a call to action for Unfound Nation. So what ways can we be helpful, supportive of Black and Bold and you and Purnell? Absolutely. Well, we just released some new innovation, a ready to drink cold brew that is available online as well as nationally in Target. It is definitely a tasty, more healthy replacement to some of those sugary energy drinks out there. It has up to 160 milligrams of caffeine and it, it fits your lifestyle, right? It's, it's just that that nice cold brew that you can take on the go. It is it is convenience personified. Supporting and trying that product is, is definitely a, a request of mine. And, and just follow us across all uh, social platforms by way of our handle, which is black and bold. That's spelled B-L-K. A-N-D-B-O-L-D. Yeah, you know, leave us the reviews after you try the product and tell your friends about us because word of mouth still and will always be the best form of advertisement. I love it. And cold brew just in time for this this, this hot summer. So I'm going to go get myself some of that for sure. Well, Rod, this has been an awesome conversation. I could probably talk to you for another two hours, but I just want to thank you for taking the time. We appreciate you and all you've been able to achieve, you and Purnell. So Thanks a lot again for having the conversation today. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank our guest, Rod Johnson, and our sponsor, Afroblox. This podcast was produced by me, Dan Kihanya, with audio editing and production by We Edit Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, or simply go to foundersunfound.com forward slash listen to, that's listen T-O, and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn at Founders Unfound. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am Dan Kihanya and you've been listening to Founders Unfound.